All right, and we have some people joining us. Yay. We'll just give everyone a minute to get logged in. All right. Okay, well, thank you for joining us for our not so super symptoms, adrenal insufficiency session of the FIOPERA Alliance virtual conference. My name is Michelle Barker and I am a patient. I am here with Dr. Irina Bankos, who will introduce herself in just a moment. But first, this program is bought brought to you by the FIOPERA Alliance, whose mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma, their families and medical professionals through advocacy, education, and a global community of support, while helping to advance research and accelerate treatments and cures. Special thanks to Progenix and Advanced Accelerator Applications for making this conference possible. Before we get started, I wanted to mention FIOPERA Awareness Week, which is this week. There are plenty of ways you can participate and all information can be found at FIOPERA.org. Share this on social media and attend our virtual events. Our agenda today will be Dr. Bankos will present for 25 minutes. Then I will briefly share my experience and ways in which I can encourage you all to embrace your inner superhero with a focus on mind and body wellness. Then we will begin answering some questions from our attendees. The information presented on this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not substitute the advice of your doctors and medical team because they have an in-depth knowledge of your medical history and your current situation. The content of this program is not influenced by any of our sponsors or supporters. And now Dr. Bankos will give herself an introduction. Well, hi everyone, my name is Irina Bankos and I'm adult endocrinologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So it's very nice weather right now here. I am passionate about adrenal disorders. I consider myself an adrenal endocrinologist and I see a lot of patients with pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas and adrenal insufficiency of any kind. So I'm hoping that what I'm what I have to share today is going to be useful. Looking forward to that. Excellent. And uh, now at this part, you can go ahead and uh, do your presentation. Excellent. I'm just um, um, will take a few seconds for me to share the screen. Absolutely. No problem. And let me just confirm with Michelle that you're seeing full screen slides. Yes, looks perfect. Okay, in that case, I'll start. So, uh, so the topic for today is living with not so super symptoms and we'll talk about adrenal insufficiency. And certainly my patients with adrenal insufficiency almost always have some symptoms to discuss and some of them are not so super. So we always attempt to uh, fix that one way or another. With any presentation I give, I list my disclosures, though none of these apply to this particular presentation. I have two objectives for this talk. One, to discuss the approach to management of primary adrenal insufficiency after bilateral adrenalectomy. And then I would really like to try to give you some insights about individualizing management of primary adrenal insufficiency to particular circumstances, because every person is slightly different. I will start with a case because before having adrenal insufficiency, people have bilateral pheochromocytomas. So this is sort of a, um, I would say a usual case of a person with bilateral pheochromocytomas that would eventually result into primary adrenal insufficiency. This patient was in his forties and he was referred to Mayo Clinic after he had a PET scan done elsewhere. And that PET scan was not done because he was suspected to have a pheochromocytoma. It was done because he had fevers and abnormal white blood count. So a bit of an unusual presentation. But because um, one of the differential diagnoses was pheochromocytomas, we did proceed with workup for catecholamine excess. And it was positive with plasma normotinephrines being 14 times higher than normal. 
And the 24 hour urine collection was again positive, was elevated norepinephrine, normotinephrine, but normal epinephrine and metanephrine. So we have made biochemical diagnosis of pheochromocytomas. And the next step is to uh, reason, really, to understand why. Why this young person has bilateral pheochromocytoma? Because when we have tumors in both sides of big size in a young person, we have to think genetic association. So we were thinking BHL, or von Hippolindo syndrome, neurofibromatosis type 1, or MEN2 syndrome right away from the beginning. Uh, why? Because these are the most common three syndromes associated with bilateral pheochromocytomas. I will not be talking, this is not within the scope of this presentation, but I think it, it, it's important to point out that bilateral fears are very commonly associated with some sort of genetic association. And based on the fact that he had noradrenergic biochemical profile, and what I mean by that, his normotinephrines were high, but his metanephrines were actually normal. We thought that out of those three syndromes, he was most likely to have von Hippolindo syndrome. Uh, of course, we also used history and physical examination to um, come to that suspicion. So as we were waiting for genetic testing, we did plan for bilateral adrenalectomy. And I can't help myself by talk about a bit of preoperative management for pheochromocytomas because it's very important to prepare the patient properly prior to that adrenalectomy with alpha adrenergic blockade that is usually initiated 14 days before surgery. And that can be done with phenoxabenzamine or doxazosin. And then we also start beta adrenergic blockade, for example, propranolol or metoprolol, that usually started several days prior to surgery, maybe five days prior to surgery. Um, of course, we use daily measurements of blood pressures and heart rates to adjust this medication so that by the time it's time for surgery, we are convinced that this person would have a safe surgery. You will also see metirazine listed in this graph. It's very rarely used, but it is. Um, uh, we have been using it in um, big tumors or in those rare situations where our patients are intolerant to phenoxabenzamine and doxazosin. Again, I will not spend much time on this. Um, it's just this patient did have bilateral adrenalectomy, and it's important to know that he received good preoperative management for that. So bilateral adrenalectomy did confirm bilateral pheochromocytomas, six centimeters on the left and 8.5 centimeters on the right. His testing also came back a few weeks afterwards. It was indeed positive for VHL in the hospital. In fact, prior to hospitalization, he actually received a full education on adrenal insufficiency, glucocorticoid and melocorticoid replacement. And he was started on glucocorticoid and melocorticoids in the hospital. So now that we've diagnosed this patient with um, uh, primary adrenal insufficiency because of bilateral adrenalectomy, I would like to talk a little bit about what primary adrenal insufficiency is. So this is a uh, chart of um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So how does this whole cortisol work? Our hypothalamus produces a hormone called CRH, which basically tells our pituitary gland to produce ACTH. And then ACTH travels to the adrenal glands and tells them to produce cortisol. This cortisol in turn would go back to hypothalamus and pituitary and tell them that there is enough cortisol and there is not enough cortisol. And basically it's, it's always sort of like an ongoing communication between the pituitary and adrenals. So what happens when we remove adrenal glands? Um, if more than 90% of adrenal gland tissue is removed, usually 100% with bilateral adrenalectomy, what happens? A person does not have adrenal glands. And because of that, that person will not have cortisol, also will not have adrenal androgens and will not have aldosterone. But cortisol is a hormone that actually talks to pituitary, not the other two. And because there is no cortisol, should we not replace it, of course, then there is a positive feedback to both hypothalamus and pituitary telling them, please produce CRH and ACTH because there is not enough cortisol. So those hormones do go up, very much up. For example, normal ACTH level is around 20 
to simplify things. And a person with primary adrenal insufficiency, it can be in thousands, like 6,000, if, if the person does not take uh, appropriate replacement therapy. So this is happening because pituitary gland does not understand why, why there is no cortisol. It just tries to stimulate more and more, but there is no gland to produce cortisol. So in this particular case, we would find undetectable cortisol, high ACTH, low DHA sulfate, which is just another name for adrenal androgens, low aldosterone, and high renin plasma activity, which is a hormone that is regulating aldosterone. Now, here comes um, um, you know, two important statements. First, primary adrenal insufficiency diagnosis post-bilateral adrenalectomy is assumed. If we remove bilateral adrenal glands, we really do not need any testing to confirm adrenal insufficiency, at least when you have surgery with a good surgeon. Um, I would say, I guess I have never seen, at least at Mayo Clinic, that after bilateral adrenalectomy, a person still has adrenal tissue. So no testing is required, and a person really has to be started on appropriate replacement therapy right away. Another thing that usually comes up uh, both from patients but also from physicians is ACTH as biomarker of adrenal insufficiency. This is one uh, endocrinopathy, endocrine problem, where ACTH, a pituitary hormone, is a terrible biomarker for adrenal insufficiency replacement. Optimal cortisol replacement will never be able to normalize this ACTH. And here's why I'm saying that. So, a pituitary production of ACTH is regulated by how much cortisol pituitary gland sees. Even if we give normal amounts of cortisol to a person with primary adrenal insufficiency, ACTH would still be high. So this is why we should not measure it. It's impossible to interpret. Unfortunately, I wish we had a biomarker. So I also would like to point out that primary adrenal insufficiency is most commonly not because of uh, bilateral adrenal activity. Most commonly in this country, it's because of Addison's disease. Patients um, with uh, bilateral adrenal activity don't have Addison's disease, should we use uh, the term properly. Addison disease is autoimmune adrenal destruction. It's not surgical removal of adrenal glands. We can also see primary adrenal insufficiency when we have bilateral adrenal metastasis from lung, breast, colon, bilateral infection that kills adrenal glands, bilateral hemorrhage, uh, infiltration with rare disorders such as sarcoidosis, uh, amyloidosis, and so on, or it can be because of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But again, during this talk, we're just talking about this reason for primary adrenal insufficiency. It's important to know that um, the reason I'm trying to distinguish it is because other causes of primary adrenal insufficiency here may need some additional things that patients with bilateral adrenalectomy do not need. So I think it's important to also give you some real uh, situations. And I would like to move on to case number two, because this particular person had some not so super symptoms. And I wanted to, to illustrate how we fix those. So this was a 41 year old college professor with history of primary adrenal insufficiency for three years. And she presented to our adrenal clinic because of ongoing fatigue, especially after lunch. She would say, look, after lunch, I have to take a nap because I, uh, and I, I still remember what she said that, I asked not to schedule any classes with my students because I cannot do it at that time. She otherwise had no symptoms, oh, also decreased sex drive and insomnia. Um, so she was wondering maybe because she did not sleep well, that's why she had that fatigue after lunch. So she just wanted um, basically an evaluation for those symptoms. On a physical exam, there are no signs of glucocorticoid, mineral corticoid, excessive deficiency. Her menstrual cycle was fine. And she was, for the last three years, on the same regimen of hydrocortisone, 15 milligrams at 7 o'clock in the morning and 5 milligrams at 6 p.m. And she was taking fludrocortisone, 50 micrograms at 7 a.m. Her potassium, her sodium, her, her TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, red and plasma activity were all within normal. So before seeing what we've done for this particular patient, I would like just to quickly uh, go over some basics of a glucocorticoid replacement therapy first. So usually, and again, usually it's not necessarily what works for a particular individual, but usually 
The starting dose is anywhere between 15 to 25 milligrams of hydrocortisone per day. And we can use it in twice a day dosing or three times a day dosing. Our goal of therapy is balancing physiological circadian glucocorticoid replacement. So what usually what happens is cortisol production with normal adrenal and pituitary gland against personal circumstances. We would monitor weight, energy levels, sleep quality, use of stress dose steroids, hospital admission circumstances around adrenal crisis. So the decision-making on management of glucocorticoid is talking. We have to talk. There is no task, really. We have to uh, spend quite a bit of time discussing the symptoms, looking at the physical exam, and trying to understand the reasoning uh, or the connection to hydrocortisone therapy to symptoms. But if I am to generalize, Signs of suboptimal replacement are fatigue, nausea, weight loss, adrenal crisis, and signs of excessive replacement, fatigue, weight gain, development of cushing weight features, and decrease in bone density. Again, very much simplification. So um, I also think it's important to know that for those people who have primary adrenal insufficiency, and for some reason they are not on hydrocortisone, but on another glucocorticoid, it's important to know that the potency as far as glucocorticoid activity differs. So if a person takes cortisone acetate, they need more um, total daily amount. Instead of 25, it's more like 40 milligrams a day. If it's prednisone or prednisolone, the equivalent dose would be around 5 milligrams, and that would be taken in the morning. So I just sometimes see mistakes being made um, and conversion being done wrongly. That's why I'm pointing this out. What about fluid cortisone? Again, to generalize, starting dose is around 100 micrograms a day, but then we should modify it based on multiple things, physical exam, history, and for this particular thing, we can use some blood work, and I'll explain. Goal of therapy is not to have orthostasis. What is orthostasis is basically feeling of lightheadedness and dizziness on change of positions, and we can actually document it by measuring blood pressure sitting and standing. We also can look at potassium and sodium, renin or renin plasma activity, which should be all within normal ranges. But that does not trump physical exam and how a person feels and what that person tells us. Monitoring symptoms of this orthostatic vitals, hypertension, and blood work, I would usually measure it every time I change food recorders on those or every time there are new symptoms. What are the signs of suboptimal replacement? The symptoms of lightheadedness, salt craving, also high potassium, high renin in the blood work. And signs of excessive replacement with food cortisone is swelling or edema of legs, high blood pressure, low potassium, and low renin. So let's go back to our case. So this was our college professor uh, with uh, fatigue after lunch, also insomnia and decreased sex drive. So um, this is a chart of, uh, so this solid line here, uh, represents what normal circadian cortisol production is in someone without adrenal insufficiency. And this um, dotted line represents what happens when we give hydrocortisone three times a day. So if we are to use this graph, so this is sort of how it looks. She takes a high dose of 15 milligrams uh, at seven o'clock in the morning. And then it sort of like gets out of her body and probably for some of her part of the day, uh, especially after lunch, her cortisol is quite low. And then she takes another dose of five milligrams of hydrocortisone at 6 p.m. And that probably lasts her um, late into the night, possibly impacting her insomnia. So I think if we are to, um, again, consider her symptoms, I would say that she does not have enough cortisol in the middle of the day, maybe too much in the morning and too much late in the evening. So what we've decided to do is to leave her on the same total amount of hydrocortisone, which is 20, but decrease her morning dose from 15 to 10, add another five milligrams at noon, and then another five milligrams at 3 p.m. So what did we do here? We, we gave her a bit more um, right before lunch at noon. And we gave her the second dose. We moved her late night dose to earlier at 3 p.m. so that it's not lasting her into the night. And hopefully we were hoping that her insomnia would resolve and fatigue would disappear, both because we added hydrocortisone at noon, but also because she slept better. 
Well, and obviously the reason I'm presenting this case because it did work. <laughs> so, so that was a simple fix for this patient because her insomnia and fatigue in the afternoon did disappear. She was quite content. But then um, uh, she uh, continued to complain about decreased sex drive. So that leads me to talking about DHA replacement. So DHA is another thing that um, women with adrenal insufficiency do not have because DHA is uh, coming from adrenal gland. DHA um, is highest in our 20s and 30s and then slowly goes down as we age. So here, this graph is a very old graph from an old paper that illustrates the normal ranges of DHA sulfate in a population of women. So obviously, in a, per in a person with bilateral adrenalactomy, this DHA sulfate would be zero. So uh, does it matter or does it not matter? No one knows for sure, but there was a, a systematic review and meta-analysis performed in 2009 by Alcatid. This is the studies that were summarized there. And basically what the studies did, they offered DHA replacement to women with adrenal insufficiency, both primary and secondary. And what they've done, they measured their um, general quality of life, anxiety, depression, sex drive, and satisfaction with sex before and after replacement. And I'm highlighting here in the blue because this chart is divided in two. Anything on the right, which is highlighted in, the, in blue, is favoring replacement therapy. Anything on the left is uh, favoring placebo. So as you see, it seems that most women experienced improvement based on this. Improved quality of life, improved, or I should say, decreased depression, decreased feeling of anxiety, and improved sex drive and satisfaction. Now, this is really on a group level. In my personal experience, the younger the woman is, the more likely she is to benefit from DHA replacement, but I offer it to any woman of any age on a trial basis. And I usually say, let's try it for six months. And if there is no change, you can always stop it. Starting dose is 25 milligrams a day. Um, but I, because it's a supplement and it's over-the-counter supplement, I have had patients who take DHEA and unfortunately, three months later, their DHEA sulfate level is still undetectable. Uh, or I had a person taking 25 and their levels are too high. So that makes me conclude that our supplements currently um, you know, in the United States, over in the United States have varied degrees of quality. So I'm saying that because um, in any unregulated supplements, we should really consider follow-up levels. So I would measure DHA sulfate level um, two months after starting DHA, and I would modify the dose or even advise changing the supplement. People ask me what type of supplement company I recommend. I cannot come up with a recommendation, both because I don't think I should, but also because I have not noticed that there's a particular brand people uh, like. So everyone is on something different. So monitoring is improvement in symptoms, but also blood work, mainly to make sure the person is actually getting DHE. Feeling better is what I'm looking for. So, so uh, signs of suboptimal replacement, no improvement in quality of life. The only side effect that is almost never there because you know we don't give high amounts of DHA is hirsutism or acne oily skin. I've had only uh, a few women who really um, had significant oily skin mainly and decided to stop DHA, maybe like 1% of all people I've tried it on. Um, yeah, okay. So, so what we've done in this case, we did start DHA supplement. Uh, several weeks after hydrocortisone change. And she did notice energy improvement, improvement in sex drive and mood. Whether it was placebo effect or truly the help of DHA, I'm not sure. But certainly we've normalized her DHA sulfate and she was very happy. I would like to talk about some special situations, something that is not usually in textbooks. <laughs> so, so first about adrenal insufficiency in pregnancy. So first, I should, before going through the special situations, I should mention that in, in my book, adrenal insufficiency should not stop for doing as anything we love. So, and that's um, any type of hobbies, any type of travel and any type of work and uh, pregnancy and so on and so on. 
Um, I have uh, marathon runners with primary adrenal insufficiency, um, famous public speakers, um, and, and so on, who uh, do not let their adrenal insufficiency stop them. But some, you know, basic rules or some suggestions, I suppose, here during pregnancy, cortisol requirements increase. So I suggest increasing hydrocortisone by five milligrams each trimester. If a person also has insulin diabetes, insulin dependent diabetes, then I, I think it may be worthwhile changing from hydrocortisone to prednisone just for more stability of that cortisol delivery with fewer glucose swings. If it's a night shift worker, it, we need to establish the new um, timeline. I usually don't give a particular timeline for one to take hydrocortisone, but I say take your first dose on waking, whenever that waking is, and your second dose six to eight hours later, if it's a twice a day regimen. If it's a three times a regimen, it's waking four hours later and three to four hours later. Um, people travel a lot, so jet lag traveling, uh, the simple rule, which could be adjusted to personal circumstances, just do hydrocortisone every six hours, five to 7.5 milligrams while traveling. A new regimen, let's say a person is going to from United States to England. So whenever that morning in England is, that's when the new morning dose starts. Okay, so I think we have some more time. So I would like to talk about the drill crisis. First of all, um, in my practice, adrenal crisis is extremely rare. I know this is not the case when, um, from what my patients tell me, but what is told on Facebook pages and so on. I'm not sure why there is so, such a, a discrepancy between my personal patients um, and adrenal crisis and what is being reported elsewhere. Maybe people who have adrenal crisis are more likely to write about it. But when I do see adrenal crisis, it's um, in agreement with this paper. It's usually because of gastrointestinal infection. And for some reason, let's say my patient forgot I did not have their glucocorticoid injection with them. So if they have a gastroenteritis and they vomit and they need extra cortisone, they don't inject, they may develop adrenal crisis. Because we're a bit obsessive compulsive about injections and education, I almost never hear about it. So some other causes of adrenal crisis are there. I also would like to say that, I guess in 99.9% .9 of situations, adrenal crisis does not happen out of the blue. A person with adrenal insufficiency usually has at least several hours to act. Um, again, I don't want to say 100%, but in most cases. So it's, um, um, it, I guess it's, it's very possible to prevent. Are patients with adrenal insufficiency equipped to prevent, to treat adrenal crisis? Not as much as I would like. I'm just highlighting the fact that in our study, which included 291 patients with primary adrenal insufficiency, quite a few of them with bilateral adrenalectomy, but also secondary adrenal insufficiency and glucocorticoid induced adrenal insufficiency, 77% of people did have glucocorticoid injection at home, uh, but not 100%. Though I was happy to see that those with primary adrenal insufficiency definitely had higher level of education around the adrenal insufficiency and more likely to have um, knowledge and uh, supplies and be comfortable self-injecting. So that's comfort with self-injection. Only 67% of patients with primary adrenal insufficiency were comfortable with self-injection of glucocorticoid. And I think that's important to... Um, I think this discomfort in the other, uh, what is it, 33% uh, of people is what may predispose to adrenal crisis. So same wearing medical alert gear, only 83% of patients wear a necklace or a, a, a bracelet stating that they have adrenal insufficiency. So what do I do to identify and um, or to uh, prevent adrenal crisis? So um, we talk about steroid emergency card or I usually print it out. I provide medical alert bracelet or necklace or I recommend a person get it. I educate my patients on sick day rule number one and sick day rule number two, which is uh, increasing or doubling the routine glucocorticoid for sick day rule number one or injecting glucocorticoid uh, in times of inability to take all a glucocorticoid for sick day rule number two. I think it's important to talk about those circumstances that this needs to be done. Now, some deviations from textbooks. <laughs> so cortisol needs do increase during stress. 
in general, doubling of hydrocortisone is recommended during sickness. It's sort of like a rigid goal, which is easy to remember. And that's what I teach as well at the beginning. But then with each visit, that's when I hope some individualization is going to happen. For example, it is okay to occasionally take extra five or 10 milligrams of hydrocortisone for special occasions, such as before intense physical activity or before giving a speech to 5,000 people. For example, if I had adrenaline sufficiency, I may have taken five milligrams of hydrocortisone before giving speech to all of you. Or for example, anticipating a stressful event, which would happen in 30 to 60 minutes. I don't want to make it as a rule, but I think it's important to think what is our stressor and whether we need to act about it. I certainly hope it will not happen every day, but several times a month, it's fine. No one will develop side effects of doing this several times a month. And I think sometimes we physicians are a bit too rigid with our recommendations. We're so concerned that our patients will take too much hydrocortisone and develop all the side effects that we sometimes forget that quality of life may be improved by minimal amounts of hydrocortisone when used properly. Um, of course, supplies are plenty. No one should run, um, uh, so, so no one should um, be struggling to get the hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone. Of course, we physicians need to see our patients in person, but we should not require um, a, a personal visit if um, um, it's not possible and just go ahead and prescribe hydro life saving hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone. Okay, so uh, just because we're almost out of time, I want to talk about one last thing because we're still in times of pandemic or, and in this particular recommendation applies to anything, any, any infection. I would like to talk a little bit about um, management in sickness. So um, at the onset of sickness, and depending on how sick a person is, I would say somewhere between 10 and 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone every six hours, it's probably what's wor what works best. And what do I mean by that? Let's say someone has terrible migraine um, and it's just so terrible that it's very unusual. So in that case, instead of 15 and five or 10 and 10 of hydrocortisone, I hope this person would remember to take 10 every six hours or 20 milligrams every six hours if it's so bad. Same goes for bladder infections or uh, COVID infection when it's high fever. Uh, really, this uh, applies to any sickness. If it's really bad, I would suggest injection, either hydrocortisone or dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. There are some pros and cons using different preparations, and I will not get into that. But any type of injection should, be, should work just as fine. Um, usually hospital transfer is not needed, but uh, I would say if it is needed, inject first and then call 911. And in the hospital, hopefully this person um, would receive um, hydrocortisone drip or hydrocortisone 100 milligrams or 50 milligrams every six hours. Fludrocortisone can actually be stopped at that time. Fluid resuscitation should be done and fludrocortisone should be restarted when hydrocortisone daily dose is under 50 milligrams. So hopefully I um, did not chat too much with this. We talked about glucocorticoid, neurocorticoid, DHA replacement, some special circumstances, having plenty of supplies, prevention of adrenal crisis, and knowledge, the importance of knowledge. And I would like to thank you. This is also my email and Twitter for any anything I may not have discussed, and I would love to have some time for questions and answers. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bankos, for your very informative presentation about adrenal insufficiency. Um, so next, uh, I am actually going to do a very brief presentation, um, just a little bit about me and um, just some very general, um, very simple tips for adrenal insufficiency. So I am going to share my screen if I can do that. Okay. All right. And oops, here we go. Okay. So my presentation, I know that um, our session is called Not So Super Symptoms, but I renamed my presentation. It's You Are Your Own Superhero. And it is using your superpowers to manage 
life with adrenal insufficiency. Um, so first, about, just a little bit I'm, about my... Not sure if you're sharing. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, let me fix it. Okay. Share screen, screen one, share. Okay, how about now? Perfect. All right, okay, thank you. Um, sorry. And let me get my notes back up. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so here is my nice title screen. Um, you are your own superhero. Um, using your superpowers to manage life with adrenal insufficiency. So a little bit about me. My name is Michelle Barker. I was diagnosed with ME2A in 2011. I've had lots of FIO reoccurrences, which is not typical of ME2A, but um, I'm just so lucky I get all of these reoccurrences and um, metastatic disease. Um, so my last adrenal was removed in 2014, and ever since then, I've been steroid dependent. Um, I started researching and learning how to best manage my adrenal insufficiency just to kind of save my own life and improve my quality of life. But using this information to help other people has become my passion. I created a, a group called Women's Adrenal Insufficiency Support Group, and I'm also an admin of the Cortisol Pump Group on Facebook. I'm also co-creator of the CortisolPump.com, which is a cortisol pumping resource guide. Um, I also created the Facebook page, Hope Education and Awareness for Rare Disease, or HERD. Um, so, for many of us, life after pheochromocytoma means adapting to life with adrenal insufficiency. The title of this session is Not So Super Symptoms, and sometimes that is part of this life, but I want to challenge this bleak perception of adrenal insufficiency. Yes, there are times it can be difficult, but you are your own superhero, and you are not a victim. An adrenal insufficiency will not defeat you. Your first superpower is communication. You and your doctor should always be partners. You are a super symptom fighting team. And with any team, communication is crucial. A symptom journal is one of the most useful items in your utility belt. Each day, just record relevant information. It can be really simple. It can be just jotting the time and date and maybe just one word about how you feel. Just check in as often as you remember. You can have a paper journal, an actual book. You can have an app uh, that you use on your phone so you always have it with you. It can be as simple or as intricate as you make it out to be. Um, if you're struggling with some specific symptoms, just record when you have those symptoms, record how often they're occurring. Um, for example, maybe it's headache, maybe it's tachycardia, uh, maybe high blood glucose, brain fog, whatever it may be. Also record your medications and your dosages because that's relevant and that will help you find a pattern. This not only demystifies your symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, it's also very valuable information to share with your doctor, and they will appreciate having actual concrete data about your symptoms because it makes their job a lot easier. Also, I just want to encourage you, do ask questions. Maybe you have some questions about your medication, or maybe you wanted to ask about trying other types of steroids. Maybe you wanted to um, try a different steroid dosing schedule. Maybe you heard about circadian rhythm dosing and you wanted to try that versus twice a day dosing. Um, maybe you want to try a different method of steroid dosing. Um, maybe you have gastrointestinal issues or some comorbidity that prevents you from adequately absorbing oral medication. So maybe you want to talk to your doctor about injections. Maybe you want to talk to your doctor about the cortisol pump. Your doctor should be happy to investigate and answer these questions for you. And if they're not, or if they're dismissive of your questions and concerns, then simply put, they're not your partner. 
uh, next slide. Okay, another crucial superpower is preparedness. You don't have to live every day in fear of having an adrenal crisis. Instead, what you can do is be prepared for it. You definitely, absolutely will need an emergency injection kit in your possession. This is usually solucortef or dexamethasone. Of course, all of us hope that we never need our emergency injections, but the fact is sometimes you will. And having this injection handy gives you the power to save your own life. There is no legitimate reason for your doctor to deny you of this life-saving medication. You will not always be near a hospital. I hear that a lot. You know, I live, you know, within this many minutes of a hospital. My doctor says I don't need an injection. Well, you're not always going to be at home. And, you know, it doesn't always happen during the day. You might have something happen to you at 2 a.m. and you're not sure if you can make it to the hospital. You're not sure if you want to wake up your your uh, partner or caregiver and if um, they're going to drive you to the hospital. You might be on vacation. You might be somewhere rural where it's hard to get to a hospital and it takes a long time for an ambulance to get to you. Um, also, you can't assume that paramedics are going to inject you. Depending on where you live and the ambulance service, not all of them can give you an injection. So don't make that assumption. Before you seek emergency services, I always recommend take your injection. If you're in doubt, take your injection and go seek emergency services. Um, the National Institutes of Health, the National Adrenal Disease Foundation, and the Mayo Clinic, as well as the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, have all stated that an emergency injection is necessary for all adrenal insufficient patients to carry. So yes, you do need it. And if your doctor refuses to give this to you, you might, you know, let them know that the NIH, the NADF, the Mayo Clinic, et cetera, all of them agree that this is the right thing to do. You can also be prepared by wearing a medical ID as Dr. Bankos talked about. Um, in support groups, I'm often asked if necklaces or bracelets are better or if tattoos count. And my answer is that all of those things are better than nothing. You should absolutely have something. Um, I have spoken with paramedics about this question though, and they do tell me that bracelets are usually the easiest thing for them to spot. I mean, they're usually visible, whereas sometimes bracelets are not. Um, Tattoos, sometimes if you have a lot of tattoos or if it's in a place they wouldn't look at, um, it may not be seen as well. But bracelets usually are what they recommend. Um, you do want your ID to be printed very clearly. Um, you want it to be very easy to read. Don't have a fancy engraved font, or if you do a tattoo, don't do some difficult font to read. Um, at bare minimum, it should have your name and it should say adrenal insufficiency written on it. Additionally, you can put um, an emergency contact, maybe your doctor's name, um, maybe where you keep your emergency injection or any other life-threatening medical conditions you might have. If you have room, put it on there. Uh, personally, my favorite is road ID. Um, I've had road ID for many, many years now. Um, they are quality. They last a long time. The print is very clear. Um, it doesn't get scratched up too bad or fade away. Um, there's lots of room on it too for printing all your different things. So I, I totally recommend it. And I've had paramedics compliment me on my road ID. So I would suggest road ID to anybody, but definitely whatever you can get, do have a medical ID of some kind. All right, the last one is super support. So even if your doctor is very highly experienced with adrenal insufficiency, and let's say they know every single fact there is to know about adrenal insufficiency, you know, hypothetically, um, there's still a whole world of just day-to-day -day experiences that you're gonna run into that your doctor won't have even thought about to advise you on. I mean, there's just too much to, to think of everything in an appointment. Um, things like, oh, do I 
qualify for disability? Um, how do I pack for my vacation? Uh, where uh, are the best places to keep my emergency kit? Um, all of these are questions that you can just ask the adrenal insufficient community. Um, I actually created um, women's adrenal insufficiency support specifically for adrenal insufficient women because I realized there were some questions that people didn't feel comfortable asking their doctors. Um, like for example, questions pertaining to sex, menstruation, maybe body image, what have you. And I noticed that having a safe place to ask these questions is really important. Just a place where you don't feel judged, where you're not going to have um, somebody of a different gender try to um, give you an answer that maybe they're not personally experienced about. Um, and I just think it's really important for our physical as well as our mental health to have this kind of peer support people to talk to. And of course, Obviously, women aren't the only ones who can benefit from having peer support. There are times that all of us, um, all of us need to talk to people that just get it, that have been there, that understand what you're going through. And sometimes just having that kind of emotional support really helps you get through. And it's, it's a really important thing. So um, I hope that you won't fall into this kind of negative suffering mentality that sometimes is associated with adrenal insufficiency. Because for most of us, this is our life without FIO. This is an improvement. And yeah, sometimes it's not an easy life, but by using some of the same superpowers you already use to defeat FIO, Adrenal insufficiency will not stop you from living a happy and healthy life. You can do anything with adrenal insufficiency as long as you just manage your symptoms and plan accordingly and are prepared for whatever might come your way. And that is my presentation. We'll go ahead and stop my screen share. All right. Well, thank you everybody so much um, for watching our presentation. Right now we have lots of time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, I do see that we have some questions here. Let's see, what symptoms would you say you struggle most with as a result of your adrenal insufficiency? Well, oof, I would say fatigue is a very big one. Um, when I first became adrenal insufficient, I was on oral steroids. Um, I did twice a day uh, dosing and it just didn't work out. I tried three times a day dosing. I tried switching to prednisone. I tried combinations of different steroids. Didn't really work out for me. Eventually I switched to the cortisol pump and that's made a huge difference. Um, I won't say that I'm like a superwoman now. Um, there's still some fatigue sometimes, especially dealing with illness that always kind of throws you for a loop. Um, but yeah, I would say that. And the other thing that's been super hard for me is managing my electrolytes, um, trying to keep from that uh, kind of low grade dehydration that happens if your electrolytes aren't balanced correctly. For whatever reason, I don't metabolize oral medications very well. Um, so fluticortisone, it's, it's tough for me because there's, there's no like injection for that at this time. So yeah, I would say electrolytes, dealing with fatigue, all of those are difficult things. Um, and let's see if we have any other questions. If you, okay, I wonder what your opinion is on bilateral adrenalectomies effect on our immune function. I seem to have much more trouble fighting off illness and end up with chronic infections much more than prior to surgery. And I think that's a good Dr. Bankos question. Sure, well, there are actually several studies showing that on a population basis, if we look at all people with adrenal insufficiency, 
it does seem that there is increased risk of infections, especially, well, any infection, but for some reason, especially fungal um, and viral infections. Now, um, also on a population basis, it seems that if a person with adrenal insufficiency is to have infection, they're most, more likely to be hospitalized as well. Now, on an individual level, it's very difficult to document a proof because you know all of us have different susceptibility to infection. So even if that um, capacity to fight infections changed with bilateral adrenalectomy, in most cases, it's not very evident. Okay. So, so I guess what you've noticed, um, the person who wrote it is very consistent with what has been published. Okay. All right, and we have another question. Hey, first off, thank you so much for the great presentations. That was a lot of valuable information. Thank you. Um, my question would be whether you are aware of any work being done to improve uh, patient comfort with self-injecting by Solucortef both, with self-injecting Solucortef both, especially to maybe get caregivers more comfortable and assisting as well. When I first received my emergency injection, I received zero training, literally was just told to pick up the prescription from the pharmacist and the pharmacist was entirely unfamiliar and I ended up with a powder only vial and no way to inject. In comparison, it was really helpful for my EpiPen to have a trainer pen to get used to the idea of self-injecting. Is there any resource being worked on to improve training for self-injecting? Dr. Bankos, do you know any? Well, so first of all, I just would, say, would like to say it's it's uh, very saddened to hear that you did not receive uh, education. I think it was really would have been very important uh, right away as soon as possible because those are the things that makes us, well, from the patient's point of view, more comfortable dealing with our disease. Now, I'm not completely sure how, it seems to me that every practice does things differently. Like for example, at Mayo Clinic, we have a one hour nurse education and training with a little ball such as this, you know, and injecting and actually using the uh, dummy injection to train. And we also have a video that Mayo Clinic developed that we give our patients to watch at home. But I wonder if, um, you know, what I, I, I think it seems to me uh, that we have to have something like this available uh, to a bigger audience, not just people who come, for example, to our institution. So that's what I have to say. I'm not aware about, uh, I guess, any intervention, let's say at the level of endocrine society, but maybe I can bring it up. Yeah, I, I will say that was my experience as well. I was not given any information about this injection, um, like nothing. And I think a lot of that was because my doctor my endocrinologist didn't know either. I mean, I was her only patient with adrenal insufficiency. And I will say, um, relating back to your presentation, when you were talking about how few people with adrenal crisis, um, you ever see that in your practice. And as someone who sees, you know, just thousands of, you know, random adrenal insufficient people in my support group, it, it is actually really common because the sad thing is not all endocrinologists are as experienced as you. And some people have doctors that, you know, maybe this is their first patient or, I mean, they just, they, I really feel like a patient's quality of life depends on the quality of their doctor. And when they have a great doctor like you, it's good. And they don't have to have, you know, adrenal crisis. Um, and then some doctors, they just aren't as experienced and patients have worse quality of life for it. And I also have noticed that patients with mo more comorbidities seem to struggle more with managing the adrenal insufficiency because, of course, our, all of our systems of our body are connected. And, um, yeah, it gets more difficult to manage when there's a lot of things kind of all competing. Um, for our next question, uh, Sandra says... What can you recommend for fatigue? And just for a little context, she has had one of her adrenal glands removed. And I guess fatigue is um, an issue for her. Uh, I guess I, I can uh, attempt answering this question. So it very much depends on what that uh, tumor was. I'm assuming it was a pheochromocytoma. 
but could it have been a rare pheochromostoma producing uh, cortisol or a sorry ACTH, which then led to Cushing's? So, what I'm getting to that if we had to remove just one adrenal gland, the remaining adrenal gland usually kicks in and takes over from that removed adrenal gland very quickly. So that person should we do all kind of dynamic tasks and intense tasks would have normal adrenal function if we had just to remove one. But I'm not sure if this is the case, like what we usually see. So maybe this in this particular case, there was more than one reason to remove a one adrenal gland. And maybe there is some sort of partial adrenal insufficiency going on. So in that case, fatigue is unlikely to be related to adrenal insufficiency. Oh, well, not in that, in the first case, it's unlikely to be related to adrenal insufficiency. And in that case, it would be good to understand why fatigue is there. There are multiple other reasons. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is all of our questions, unless anyone wants to, um... oh, one last question. Has Dr. Bankos, seen bilateral pheos with TMEM127 genetic syndrome? In my own practice, I do not recall any with bilateral. I have seen quite a few with unilateral, but I don't, I just don't recall right now having anyone with bilateral. Yeah, right. I, but that's my practice. That's <laughs> right, right. All right, and we are about out of time. Um, so for closing, let's see. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Bankos for presenting. And um, all of our sessions are going to be available for viewing on this platform for 90 days, I think it was. Um, after that, they will be available on YouTube on the FIO Para Alliance channel. Um, so please tune in to the rest of our conference session in the upcoming days for FIO Para Awareness Week. Um, we also encourage you to participate in our Awareness Week by going to fiopara.com for our toolkit and learn ways that you can raise awareness. So I wanna thank all of our participants, um, everyone uh, that was with us today in the FIO Para Alliance for putting this on. And thank you so much, everyone.